Hello and uh, welcome to this special ASPE panel discuss discussion on reforming Australia's electronic surveillance laws. I'm Fergus Hansen, one of the directors at ASPE, and with us today is an extremely authoritative um, panel to discuss these very important reforms. Our very distinguished panel includes uh, two secretaries, uh, Mike Pizzullo, the Secretary of the Department of Home Affairs, Catherine Jones, the Secretary of the Attorney General's Department. We also have Ian McCartney, the Deputy Commissioner of Investigations at the Australian Federal Police. Rachel Falk, the CEO of um, the Cybersecurity CRC, and Tom Damon, the Director of Corporate External and Legal Affairs at Microsoft Australia. The electronic surveillance reforms we'll be discussing today are part of a wider wholesale overhaul of the legal framework of the national intelligence community, a process that kicked off, uh, that was kicked off by the comprehensive review uh, led by Dennis Richardson. To launch the two-year process to reform the electronic surveillance framework, Home Affairs has uh, released a detailed discussion paper and public feedback on that is open until the 11th of February. That paper paints a picture of some of the challenges uh, posed by the current system. There's a patchwork of legislation uh, that now exceeds 1,000 pages and 35 different warrants and authorizations which makes it very difficult for both national security agencies um, and the public to understand the law with clarity. There's legacy different definitions that do not capture uh, what are now ubiquitous technologies like URLs, creating legal gray areas. And lawful access to telecommunications data um, by a range of organizations may now go beyond what was originally intended by parliament. The comprehensive review also points to the imperative um, for safeguards to be maintained in order to ensure public trust. It cautions that reform should not be viewed as simply removing administrative red tape when that red tape is there to support an essential democratic principle. The review rebuked agencies that proposed removing safeguards to make modest administrative time savings and warned government that the term administrative burden tends to be thrown around too loosely by NIC agencies. Government should, it said, be wary of and properly test such claims. To that end, the discussion paper proposes guiding democratic principles in which to ground the reforms and some changes to safeguards and oversight. The format for today will be uh, short framing remarks from Secretary Pizzullo, We'll then move to a moderated discussion with the panel before we take uh, questions from you. So please uh, submit your questions via the, the LiveStorm platform and um, do vote up the questions that you like the most and I'll do my absolute best to get through as many of them as possible. And with that, it's my uh, pleasure to hand over to you, uh, Secretary Pizzullo, for your opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Fergus, and thank you uh, especially to ASPE for hosting us and to uh, for facilitating this very important discussion. Uh, I just want to echo a number of comments that you've already made just to underline and underscore a couple of key framing points. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to be joined by all of my co-panellists, but I particularly am delighted to be joined uh, as a peer uh, in this process by Catherine Jones of the Attorney General's Department. Catherine and I, as, as in her predecessor agreed from the outset that this reform, wholesale reform as you've described it and as is set out in the discussion paper, really requires a close partnership between the two departments and our two portfolios because there is a duality at work here. Yes, on the one hand, the challenge of going dark, the challenge of chasing criminals, uh, persons involved in child exploitation of the most heinous nature, uh, terrorists and the like, is getting uh, certainly more and more difficult for law enforcement, national security agencies and the intelligence agencies. But I completely agree with Dennis Richardson's characterisation that you've already picked up in a couple of comments, Fergus, made in the comprehensive review. The burden of filling out uh, uh, red tape, as is sometimes described in relation to warrants and the like, should not be seen in those terms. Rather, 
as the challenge becomes more difficult, where new technologies, which were just simply not contemplated in the 1970s and the 1980s, when a lot of the principal legislation was written, the relevant provisions, for instance, in the ASIO Act, the Telecommunications Interception Act of 1979, or the Surveillance Devices Act of 1984, the reason why those burdens are in fact creating impediments to investigation, it's not a simplistic issue of form filling and having to comply with lots of different documents under different parts of different statutes. It reflects the fact that there's been a fragmentation, in fact, of the oversight, warranting and authorisation effort because we've been trying to fit new challenges and resolve new challenges, whether it's metadata retention, whether it's uh, encrypted communications, whether it's more recently the reforms that you've seen in relation to anonymised technology, such as VPN and dark web anonymised infrastructure. What we've been trying to do, particularly over the last 10 to 15 years, when most of these reforms have been built upon layer of layer, layer of previous reform, is trying to fit new realities onto very old constructs, and hence the so-called burden arises. However, in trying to rationalise, streamline uh, and make the powers more efficient for our law enforcement, security and intelligence colleagues, because we've all got the same aim of ensuring that those who would have us, uh, do harm to us, whether criminal harm, the exploitation and violence against children, uh, terrorist harm, we've all got the same uh, view that they should be appropriately, proportionately uh, the subject, made the subject of surveillance interception and the like, so the properly um, founded, legally conducted investigations and operations can be conducted. Surely there's not much debate on that head principle. The question that then arises is, as we put more and more incremental layers upon layer upon layer, and you've almost got to peel it back as an archaeologist would uh, peel back different levels of how civilization has been constructed, you inevitably are going to get to, to a point, and Richardson, in fact, found that we're pretty much there, where the artifice of trying to fit those new realities, those new types of communication, communications methodologies, data methodologies, connectivity methodologies that were just simply not even probably contemplated in any concrete form in the 1970s or 80s when the principal legislation was written, we're getting to a point now where the uh, adaptations, the, the amendments, the in part wholesale revisions of whole sections are really creating the problem of potentially unintended consequences where you've got a, a, a fragmentation of the uh, oversight, the authorisation and the powers piece potentially combined with the phenomenon that we've in fact experienced, which is to say whenever you do tackle a challenge, whether it's metadata and retention of metadata, the advent of cloud computing, the advent of encrypted ubiquitous communications technologies, the advent of anonymizing technologies. Just when you've addressed or you think you've addressed that piece, a new evolution in the technology or a new adaptation or application of the technology comes along and you start the incremental process again. So to that end, to balance both proper scrutiny, authorization and oversight of the use by the state of the most intrusive powers that the parliament makes available to the state, which is surveillance, uh, interception, the monitoring of citizens and non-citizens alike, combined with supporting our agencies to do what, they're, what, what we ask them to do, which is to keep us, us safe from harm, it's very important that we get the duality of that balance right. Operational effectiveness is certainly very important, but so is, and sometimes it even trumps, uh, those factors are trumped by, the oversight requirements that the parliament puts in place to protect liberty and freedom, because of course, the untrammeled pursuit of security comes potentially at such a price that you're actually defeating the very values that you're, that you're seeking to uh, defend uh, when you're pursuing security objectives. So to that end, the government in considering the comprehensive review that, brought, that was brought down by Richardson, commissioned a very long duration process, this process that we're discussing this evening. The task force, yes, to be hosted in and anchored in home affairs, but working very closely, not just with the agencies that might seek um, a reform and a renovation of these powers for their own quite legitimate operational purposes, 
but to be done very much in partnership with our colleagues in the Attorney General's Department and other colleagues who in a sense are there to ensure that the checks and balances, that the process is there to keep us honest. Considerations of privacy, proportionality, proper oversight and regular scrutiny. Um, oversight, not just in an administrative term, in administrative terms within the executive branch, but obviously oversight through judicial and quasi-judicial processes. And hence the partnership that I mentioned at the outset with my colleague, Catherine Jones, over at the Attorney General's Department. I'll conclude on, on this uh, point, which is really about what we're seeking through the consultation process. And this uh, forum this evening is very much part of that. Uh, we've kicked off the consultation process with the launch of the discussion paper that you mentioned, uh, Fergus, but tonight is a way in which to gather key informed stakeholders to uh, extend and amplify and to deepen the collaboration that we would very much like to engage with in a very genuine uh, deep uh, consultative process. We really want to hear from experts in the field about the challenges that are discussed in the discussion paper. How do you get these balances right? Almost at a philosophical level between security and liberty, but then really in a more granular sense, starting to get down to more detail. What, is, what are the best methods and modes by which to do that? There is a suggestion in the discussion paper, for instance, to perhaps focus more on entities and have a more technology neutral view, which is not beholden to and not a hostage to future change, such as changes in the way in which content is managed or generated, the way in which content is moved, moving away from distinctions such as data in motion and stored data, where you start to focus on the objective, which is to surveil and intercept the communications and the content of your targets who are the subject of lawful identification and authorization and being much more neutral about the way in which they communicate, the technologies they use, and indeed how they adapt quickly with the ever emerging uh, um, availability of new technologies that just seem to be coming on the market with an ever greater and accelerated cadence. So Fergus, I'll leave it there. Suffice to say, as my very concluding comment, we're very keen to hear views. Some of them will be very philosophical. Some of them will be uh, around more legal technicalities. I'm sure other views will be uh, put to us more in relation to very concrete communications, almost engineering type issues. We wanna hear it all. It's a very a genuine a process of seeking to engage and ingest as much as we can by way of input. And then of course, the government's got us on a timeline which uh, should that, that not be changed after the next election would see uh, the presentation to the public of exposure legislation later this year with a view to its introduction sometime during the course of calendar year 2023. Thank you, Fergus, back to you. Thank you so much, Secretary. Um, maybe I could just ask you for one um, brief chasing question around um, the impact of this these reforms, it's obviously going to have an impact on government departments, it's obviously going to have an impact on industry, um, but could you talk just briefly about what the effect is for the for everyday Australians? Is this about making it clearer to them, you know, when these laws apply and when they don't apply and, and safeguards and protections? Could you talk a little bit about what, what the effect is for them? Well, I'd, I'd like to get to a point, and some of these principles are articulated in, in the comprehensive review as well as in the government's response. I'd like to get to a point if we can design the legislation almost as if we are uh, not just renovating, to use a, a metaphor from, 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 from property development, not just renovating an existing structure, but literally uh, clearing a, a site, uh, levelling it, understanding uh, what's in the ground, what all the different uh, conditions are in relation to that site and building the new structure together. I'd like to, as we do that comprehensive overhaul, that more than a renovation but a rebuild, we can actually, in the design of the legislation, give, I, I, you made a reference to, I think, everyday Australians, everyday Australians' confidence that it would be highly unusual, highly unusual for any of their data, any of their devices, or indeed any of their engagement through their devices with data to be the subject of surveillance or, or interception as we move hopefully away from a notion which has crept into the discussion around surveillance of the mass ingestion of data almost for a store it and use it later basis. I'd, I'd like for, 
I certainly, speaking almost personally, would like to think that most everyday citizens would be able to go about their daily business presuming, because they, they know what their own behaviours are, presuming that then if they're not involved in criminal activity, because they know what sort of activities they're involved in, child sex, sexual exploitation, money laundering, terrorism, that they should feel a very high level of confidence that their communications, their devices, their interaction on the internet is in fact not the subject of any kind of government uh, scrutiny or attention whatsoever. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Catherine, I was wondering if I could uh, turn to you. Um, from a, a legal perspective, it sounds like we have a little bit of a dog's breakfast on our hands at the moment, uh, over a thousand pages of legislation, more than 35 different warrants and authorizations. I was just wondering, from, from your position at Attorney General's Department, why is that a problem? And when you look around the globe, are there any countries that you see that have they've got this right at the moment? Thanks, Fergus, and thanks to ASPE for hosting this panel session. Um, one of the things uh, Mike Pazula and myself are very uh, on a unity ticket uh, on is about um, wanting to have the opportunity to dis to talk uh, about these really significant reforms and have the opportunity to engage with the broad uh, range of stakeholders. And so uh, this is a fantastic opportunity. Um, I'll start off by noting uh, Secretary Pizzullo referenced um, layers of reform that have happened across uh, these uh, pieces of electronic surveillance legislation over the years. I personally may have been responsible for adding a few of those layers over the years, uh, both in relation to metadata and other, other reforms that have happened. Um, and, and I'm highly conscious of the fact that that uh, the description that uh, Mike gave around uh, how that accretion of reform and change uh, and trying to respond to the evolving operating environment and the lived experience uh, of uh, citizens and law enforcement and intelligence agencies in this country um, has, has prompted an incremental approach to changing the laws and I think along the way has made them incredibly complex uh, and challenging. Um, so I think we have an opportunity here to make the legal framework associated with uh, providing electronic surveillance tools to agencies to provide critical uh, uh, activities to protect us in the context of um, crime, serious crime and national security. Um, this is a great opportunity to make that, those laws more, more coherent. And I think that's a really fundamental and important part of justice, that your, your laws are coherent uh, and transparent. Uh, I think at the moment, trying to explain to people our uh, electronic surveillance framework is, is very challenging and anyone who's had to navigate their way through it, whether, uh, uh, whether they're the agencies themselves, whether they're individuals or their, and their legal representatives who may uh, 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 find themselves uh, affected by those laws, whether they're private sector companies uh, that uh, have to comply with requests under those laws, uh, it is really quite challenging. So I think we have a generational opportunity to improve in this space. Uh, and from the perspective of really critical fundamental rights, and getting that, the, the, ensuring that that balance that Mike Pazullo referenced uh, between effectiveness uh, uh, for agencies and uh, protecting rights, I think we've got a, a, an opportunity to do that in a much more embedded by design way, rather than um, the, 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 the ad hoc way it's been developed over the last 30 years. So uh, working closely with Home Affairs, uh, we're able to be engaged as these uh, reforms are being uh, considered, discussed with stakeholders, designed, uh, and ensure that we can put in uh, absolutely the most effective um, safeguards that are built into the legislation, but also the most effective oversight mechanisms. Uh, so I think from the perspective of uh, ensuring that we get that balance right, ensuring uh, that uh, the protections for individuals 
uh, are, are strong and the any interference uh, is, is has that proportionate proportionality around it that is consistent with our international obligations as well as our uh, expectations of Australian citizens, this is a great opportunity to, to make sure that we can get that right uh, and have it as strong as we possibly can. In terms of international experience, um, uh, I think, you know, but based on the survey that we've done to date uh, and the engagement we have, and these are issues that are well discussed, particularly uh, amongst Five Eyes uh, countries, and we've looked at uh, um, both the UK experience, um, uh, the uh, New Zealand experience, probably the UK have done the most recent comprehensive review of uh, legislation in this space. Uh, it's a bit hard to um, draw exact experience because everyone's fra operating frameworks are quite different. But, it, but I think from, um, from our observation, we can look at um, how the, the UK has most recently gone about um, uh, responding to some of the challenges that um, we've identified here in terms of that balance, in terms of changing definitions of personal information, in terms of changing definitions of, um, of, of our expectations, well, not definitions, but changing expectations of what protecting personal information and privacy uh, is. Um, I think looking at the UK experience has been quite helpful and we'll continue to look at that. Thank you, Secretary. Um, just one uh, chase of question, I guess, to get into the detail. So for people who haven't read necessarily the discussion paper or the, the review, I was wondering if you could just paint a bit, a sort of bit of a picture of some of the detail. So one of the uh, examples you know, in the, cited in the discussion paper is this definition that we've got at the moment around a communication. And a communication, it sounds, you know, fairly straightforward to a, a lay person. I imagine that, you know, communication is, you know, lots of different forms. But the d discussion paper raises the fact that this is actually a very clear and uh, ambiguous uh, definition at the moment. Could you tell us why is that unclear and are there other kinds of information that need to be captured by a new definition of communication? Yeah, th thanks, Fergus. Um, th this is, uh, I think, a really good and interesting example uh, about how the evolution of technology, evolution of uh, the way in which uh, communication happens uh, in the modern age with the devices uh, and the platforms and the systems that we have, uh, that's something that you know, a term like communication that I think uh, 30, 35 years ago when the legislation was initially developed, uh, there was a uh, probably a, a well understood uh, implicit under, uh, a sense of what communication was about. It was something that happened between human beings, between people uh, that involved uh, um, either direct or, or communication over a, a device. Um, with the development of different modes of uh, communication uh, through device, uh, different devices, we're now seeing that uh, it, there could be circumstances in which you're seeing information communicated via machine-initiated um, or machine-initiated uh, communication that may or may not involve a human being being involved in that communication. Uh, but we need to understand what that is, uh, is it capable uh, of being characterised uh, in a different way, uh, what are the types of powers we might need to be able to surveil that information. So uh, it, it's a fascinating area and it really goes to the way that uh, um, how over in particular the last decade uh, the explosion of new ways of uh, communicating uh, will require us to grapple with that. And I don't believe that that's going to be an easy part of this reform process. Uh, and we also need to be conscious of the fact that what the, the, the trends that we're seeing now in terms of communication, um, uh, they're only going to accelerate into the future. So we're going to have to grapple with coming up with a definition around these issues uh, that makes sense now, that, that's capable of managing um, new developments in technology and in the way that um, we communicate and share information 
uh, uh, across devices. Thank you, Secretary. Um, Rachel, I was wondering if I could maybe turn to you. Um, Secretary Jones talked about um, some of the international experience that might be um, being drawn upon here now. Could, could you have a perspective on the UK experience of changes to surveillance legislation and how that might be able to inform uh, this complex process that is now being undertaken here in Australia? Sure. So I think uh, what's important to note here, and as, as Secretary Pizzullo and certainly Secretary Jones have said, this is about obviously um, disrupting serious criminals, uh, threats to national security, and it's about intelligence gathering and why that's so important because there's such a, it's a t telecommunications data in all its forms that we've just spoken about today is rich evidence for a range of reasons. In the UK, certainly they had um, so that massive surveillance um, changes to their surveillance powers, and they took a couple of years to do it, but they, uh, involved, uh, they had a range of stakeholders involved from the civil society right through to the public and oversight. Um, and I note that the discussion paper does mention that public views, and obviously uh, Catherine Jones mentioned it, that the public views are sought. But it's vitally important that, that these are explained to the public. And I'm sure, uh, you know, many people will not necessarily want to be concerned by them. But it's important that the public have a clear eye view. And in Britain, they did that. They certainly uh, were successful in also doing that in a range of case studies, which, uh, whilst not giving away any classified information, also lent context to why they were needed. What threats were they thwarting? That's really important from a serious criminal perspective, from a serious crime, but also national security perspective. So I think that they um, they went to great lengths in public reporting to explain the cases, the context, and the oversight mechanisms and why these warrants were necessary and what they would achieve. So the UK experience, uh, there's a report by David Anderson at the time called A Question of Trust, and it was very thick if anyone's looking for some holiday reading, but very important because they go to great lengths to um, explain the what and the why, why it matters and why the public should be concerned or not concerned, but why... Uh, while it may seem intrusive, some of the powers, at the same time, intrusion is counterbalanced with warranted access, limited, time-bound. And I think that's what, obviously, there's a lot of work involved here in this one, but assuring the public that uh, it, it, there's processes for discarding excess material caught, there's processes for discarding material not used, there's massive oversight and capabilities involved. So there's a, a whole chain that's involved here. So I think there's a lot that can be learned and gleaned from the And whilst we may not replicate in its entire. Rachel, we might have just um, lost connection there. So I might just uh, move on to um, the, the. I wanted to move on to the coal face of, of actually um, dealing with these, operationalising these uh, requests and get to you, uh, Ian and Tom. Um, Ian, maybe from a, a law enforcement point of view, can you paint a picture of what it's like at the, the coalface when it comes to working within the current frameworks? Um, when I speak with people who use the, you know, the TIA Act, for example, you quickly get the impression that it's, it's a very complex legal beast. Can you tell us what it's like to actually operate in the, in the current environment and where what might be an ideal um, framework, what that might look like from your perspective? Yeah, thanks, Fergus. I think it's probably important to explain why we operate in this environment and why we need these uh, these powers. The reason is the criminal threat, and the criminal threat is real. If you look at the broad spectrum of terrorism, organised crime, child exploitation, and cybercrime, as as a community, we're under a real threat. When I joined the AFP over 30 years ago in 1990, we had a typing pool. We didn't have computers, so I'm not saying that to show my age. But there's a couple of aspects to that: is the rapid advancements in technology, but also when I joined the AFP, the majority of crime that we investigated was in the real world. The majority of crime we investigate now is online, and that creates real challenges for us, particularly with issues such as encryption and anonymizing technology. 
we're helping really assisted by the legislation and both the secretaries have spoken about that in terms of the developments of the last couple of years, a number of years, but it's complex and it's complex for people on, in our view and we're very supportive of what's being proposed is, is simplification. Not more powers, not, not a reduction on, on oversight, but simplification in terms of the powers that we utilise. I think the Secretary said the TI Act has been amended over 100 times and across all the legislation we have over 20 warrants, law enforcement warrants that the AFP can apply for in terms of the work that we do. And this can be to access the same information at different information points. One of the issues is the legislation does have a focus on the technological, technological means or the method to obtain information as opposed to the type of information we want to obtain. And at present, the AFP and other agencies, we may need to, to prepare multiple warrants for multiple warrant applications to various issue authorities against different statutory, statutory criteria and different thresholds that are functionally equivalent in terms of what we're trying to do. So I'll give you a practical example, Fergus. If we wanted to intercept text messages and transport, transit between suspects, we'd seek a warrant under the TI Act. However, the text messages were stored on a phone or a computer would obtain a warrant under the Surveillance Devices Act. However, if it was stored by a communications carrier, carrier, we would need a stored communications warrant under the TI Act. So we've got some really smart people in the AFP, but this can be challenging in terms of, in terms of the, the powers that we utilize. And again, this is not a, this is not a, a discussion in theory. Everything that we do is challenged through, through the court process and challenged very vigorously. So in terms of what we'd like to see, obviously the, the issue of, uh, of simplification, we, we don't want more powers. Uh, we, we've been blessed particularly the last couple of years with the slide, like the secretary's mentioned that. But we want it to be tech neutral and, and future proof. So we're not continuing to have this conversation over the years and streamline and, and simplify. And as the secretary from AGD said, one, one of the real issues for us is, is the definitions and the need to clarify and, and modernize those definitions, particularly, I think we've had that discussion around the TI Act in terms of the definition of communication. That creates real challenges for us and what that definition actually is. Thanks, Fergus. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, maybe I can just go to the, the, the flip side of that, Tom, and, and come to you from an industry perspective. Um, what are the biggest challenges for a company the size of Microsoft in facilitating requests and authorizations from, from law enforcement? Well, first, a huge thank you, Fergus, to you, to ASPE, to all, you know, all of the government speakers on the panel and everyone else in the audience who was involved in the consultation. Uh, we, from an industry perspective, we very much appreciate the very broad, open, transparent process we've had here. It's been great to participate. We've provided written feedback, oral feedback, a, a really terrific uh, open and transparent process. So thank you to everybody involved. Uh, to answer your question, uh, let me sort of make a macro point first, and that is, we all really have a common shared interest in triaging and responding to these requests uh, in the most efficient and streamlined way possible. Simple to, to use the, uh, the, the prior response. And that's true whether the answer is a yes or a no. Simplification is absolutely critical. And so with that common injective in mind, I would identify sort of three tactical logistical steps that we can all take together to help speed up this process. And these are three steps that we've re mentioned in our written feedback as well. Uh, first, we strongly recommend creating a central clearing house for these sorts of warrants, in part to avoid some of the duplication and redundancies that we see in other countries around the world grappling with this legislative modernization. Uh, second, uh, we strongly also recommend working on upskilling the technical skills and abilities of people who have the legal ability to issue these sorts of warrants. Uh, and then finally, we also believe that it's critical to issue these requests as close as possible to the owner of the data, the customer or the enterprise, as opposed to the cloud service provider. Now, this last one is a bit nuanced and, and might seem counterintuitive to some, but it's actually a really critical step to reducing the amount of churn and negotiation, streamlining the process, and perhaps most importantly of all, increasing public trust and confidence in, in the all-up exercise. So three tips and recommendations on our end and thank you again for the the conversation and dialogue here this evening thank you so much tom um rachel we uh dropped you dropped out halfway through your question so i just wanted to come back to see whether um there was any additional points but if you if you'd 
we're finishing up your comment. I was going to ask you a, an additional question of just your sense of how industry, whether it's traditional or new, you think you see them as responding uh, to the reforms. Sure. Sorry about that. I'm having some internet issues. Uh, and uh, yes, anyway, um, thank you. I did finish up my last question. But in terms of uh, industry and how they respond, always from an industry perspective, I put up my old Telstra lawyer hat, a few things industry will always want. They want they certainly want to lower costs of obligation for any of these things. Um, cost and burden is always huge because you don't want to make it more complex for them to comply. They, uh, My experience at Telstra, they, don't, they won't seek to look really beyond the warrant, but it's always helpful if they understand what they're being asked to do. And, and it's very clear that they're not, they don't want to be at a market disadvantage. That is that uh, when I was there for metadata, it meant that systems had to be built because traditionally uh, some of the new um, obligations simply weren't backed into a telco because their job is to charge for calls made and things like that and they didn't have some of the systems in place. They don't. No industry player will want to be at a market disadvantage. My experience at Telstra is they always want to help. They won't. They would want to do what's right legally. They will always want to assist where legally and lawfully they should do so. Uh, but today's breadth of organisations that have to comply, as we've just heard, goes to well beyond traditional uh, plain old telephone services. And we saw that with Tola. So it's vitally important, I think, from my own experience, understanding what's asked, understanding warrants. Are they appropriately signed off to this legislation if it passes will be part of that. My experience is it's really difficult when you're faced with 35 different warrants Every state have, has nuances. You can literally be trying to work out what one state has over another. They're all very different. So for me, uh, if I'm putting my old industry hat back on, the, the different mechanisms can prove to be quite challenging for staff involved in administering these warrants. Uh, they will want to comply. And most importantly, they will want cover so that if anything is wrong, they can go back to a piece of legislation to say we complied as we were told to do so and we were authorised to do so by law. Uh, and that's all they want. No industry player wants to um, take a view, in my opinion. They never want to take a view about whether something's right or wrong. They just want to know what they're supposed to do with, with without having to build new systems and have completely onerous obligations. That's my experience. It's got to be, we talk about it being streamlined. It's also got to be streamlined for industry as well. I'm sure Tom has a view. And, and to his point, as close as possible to the source is important for a range of reasons. But in my experience, if they, uh, from a telco perspective, they will always want to do what is legal and what is right. Great. Well, thank you. Um, it's, it was billed as a consultation. We were getting a lot of uh, questions to be consulted on, so I will. Uh, I might pivot now to questions from our audience. Uh, and thank you all for sending in so many questions, and, and please keep them coming. Uh, the first question is from the most voted question is, is from uh, William, who asked, who says um, the original drafters of the existing legislation no doubt hoped that their laws would also be tech neutral, but they couldn't be expected to anticipate everything about the future. How can we avoid this new legislation also becoming another house of cards that has to also be dismantled and remade? Um, maybe uh, one of the secretaries would uh, be willing to jump in on this one. Yeah, look, I'll, I'll have, um, uh, I'll, I'll have a, a go at that and perhaps Catherine, you might uh, want to join in. I. I the premise of the question, I don't know that I fully agree with. If you go back to the debate through the 1970s, partly driven off the back of, uh, if you will, the ancestor of, of Richardson's comprehensive review, the, the HOPE reviews into the intelligence community, but at the same time, a lot of work done through law reform commissions and similar bodies through the 70s, they actually were looking at technology. The, the question uh, up until the 70s of the ambiguous and potentially ultra virus nature of interception on people's telephones. In other words, the nature of the technology itself was the concern. Largely fixed line communications. Most people on this uh, webinar, Fergus, I suspect, unless they've gone to a museum and go to the part of the museum, like a telephone museum where they've got the rotary dial uh, sort of handset that I had in my house when I was growing up, uh, in uh, in the late 60s in, in Sydney, uh, the concern was who's on that line? And, and and the debate, and certainly, Catherine, I think some of your colleagues who perhaps have been around not quite that long but, but for a while would recall the debates of the 70s and into the early 80s led by law reform commissions, 
uh, off the back of the HOPE uh, investigations in the intelligence communities of the 1970s. And, and when you go back, again, as if you will, through the archaeology of all those layers, like a good archaeologist, and sort of scrape out all of the all of the dust, and you go down through the layers. It very much was about technology, and that's why the telephone, uh, the Telecommunications Interception Act, nineteen seventy nine, which in its core elements has not much changed. So a lot of layers have been put on top of it. Is actually about largely trying to think about a telephone network, the sort of issues that Rachel was talking about. And then when mobiles came along, they, they, there was almost a, a fiction initially that, well, the devices might move around, but it all sort of comes into a fixed network anyway. So we'll continue with the underlying principles of the 1979 legislation. Then when it became apparent as surveillance technology became more mobile, um, listening devices and the like, which hadn't been attended to in the TIA legislation, the same loop of logic was pursued in the, in the early 1980s. How do we think about this technology in terms of who can listen to you, who can visualise you, who can track you? Uh, and so the core principles of both of those pieces of legislation, um, I, I have to say, are actually very technology focused. What we'd like to do, and, and, and uh, the comprehensive review laid out some guidance, the PJCIS, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security has also done a number of reviews over the years including a very important review in 2013 into the TIA Act, where the, where the flip of that model uh, started to emerge, where if the objective is to surveil someone, if to, to gain information about their activities, their motives, uh, or other, other facets of their lives, how do you lawfully, if you will, proportionately target your resources, irrespective of how that data is stored, communicated, moved about, and it could be, as Catherine was saying earlier, uh, related to machine-to-machine -machine communication. So, for instance, driverless cars, the signals that they'll start to emit, uh, will that be a surveillance issue or an uh, interception issue? Well, let's go to the objective. If you're trying to track, for instance, a murderer or, or, a, or a terrorist, either in real time or uh, in close retrospective time in order to, get, to gather evidence, what's being communicated, how they're communicating, the signals that are being generated by their behaviour, the content of what they're trying to communicate, all the metadata, is actually, on one view, that should be the secondary consideration. The primary consideration is, what is the state trying to do with this person? They're trying to build uh, evidence as part of an investigation. They're trying to disrupt their activity. They might be on their way to conduct a terrorist exercise. Uh, they might be running a dark web where children are being exploited and, and, br and brutalised. So if you actually move to a very different philosophical starting point in this legislation, you actually move away from technology completely. And what you're saying is, and it, it's been mentioned a couple of times already by, by my co-panellists, who are the persons who, through their uh, known actions or their suspected act actions, who are the persons, if you will, that, that are deserving of intrusive scrutiny and then for the rest of us how do we just get how do we get reassured that we're just able to live our lives without the state watching us having the gaze of the state on us so i think we should take a very in fact i, I would contend the best way to do this is to take a very different starting point and actually not start from the tech end of it they even not even start with the definitions of what communications are etc that has to be cleaned up but actually start with what you're trying to do which is the state is trying to surveil persons of interest, and that ought to be defined first, lawfully, proportionately, and then you can almost say, as new technologies come along, as, as long as the entity, the network or the person is properly defined and lawfully defined, perhaps with time limitations and points of review, irrespective of what machine, device or technology they're using, they are fair game for limited, proportionate surveillance. The rest of us are, are left alone. So I think the starting point, if the starting point is made different, you start to resolve the, the, the problem of um, uh, f future technologies blindsiding you or surprising you. Did anyone else want to jump in on that? I'll just take a quick, I might move to the next question then. Um, so also a very popular question was uh, from, from Monique. And, um, She's asked, uh, can the panel speak to the disjuncture between the rationale supporting the surveillance powers, i.e. terrorism, child sexual abuse, 
and the actual exercise of the powers, i.e. metadata, mostly used for investigation of drug offences and the threshold of what constitutes serious crime. Did anyone want to jump in on that? I've, I've, I've got a comment to make, but I might defer to Catherine in the first interest, because we, in the first instance, we, we co-share administration of the criminal code and, and part of the answer lies there. But, but Catherine, can I, can I defer to you in the first instance? Catherine, you might be on uh, mute. Thank you. I am, thank you. Um, thanks, Mike. Uh, I'm not sure that I would uh, accept precisely the premise of the, the question uh, in terms of um, the use of, um, the, the balance of the use of uh, electronic surveillance and uh, Ian McCartney might be able to uh, expand on that. Because um, I think um, we need to understand more broadly the, the types of uh, activities and uses that uh, electronic surveillance uh, goes to. And uh, I would make uh, one point that with a lot of um, electronic surveillance is in fact, you know, quite critical uh, in the work of a lot of our oversight and integrity agencies uh, in government. Uh, it plays a very significant role in us being able to protect and maintain key institutions. Uh, and uh, it's certainly in terms of oversight agencies' ability to ensure that uh, our enforcement and intelligence agencies are operating appropriately, uh, electronic surveillance has a role to play there. So I think um, uh, in terms of the, the balance of where um, electronic surveillance warrants are sourced, the types of activity that it's uh, addressed at. I think it's, it is quite broad. I don't think it's, um, uh, it, it, it's disproportionately focused on um, minor crime. It's certainly uh, my experience and observation over many years is um, that it's been critical to um, uh, very significant critical areas such as um, most of the key counter-terrorism operations that would have been undertaken in the last 10 to 15 years uh, 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 um, have certainly been um, heavily drawn on uh, electronic surveillance. But Ian might be able to further expand on that. Thanks, uh, Secretary. I think it gets to the, the issue of balance in terms of finding that right balance. And obviously, you know, from our perspective, is, is having the powers in place, those tools in place that we can actually tackle the threat. And the threat, as I've said, is real. But what we're doing is lawful and what we're doing is, is under warrant. But importantly, it's proportionate and reasonable. And, and for example, the, the slide legislation that was recently introduced, those three new powers in terms of what we have to show to an issuing, issue, issuing officer to, to obtain a warrant is we need to show that they're proportionate and reasonable. So in terms of the, the crimes that we investigate, I think we, we've got over 100 CT investigations on, on our books. We've utilised, we've extensively utilised the powers that we've been provided by the Australian government, and those powers have been provided. We've saved lives in, in relation to utilising those powers. Drugs, we, of course, we use uh, uh, the powers, in, but we use them proportionally and reasonably in terms of the, the matters we investigate. Unfortunately, a uh, significant amount of drugs have been imported into this country. It's such a serious offence. It's a, it's a life penalty under the legislation, but again. It's 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 focused on serious crime, but it's focused on using those powers proportionally and reasonably. Secretary Bazul, are you want to jump in on anything, or are you go to the next uh, question? Oh, have you just gone on mute, Mike? Sorry, am, am I back? Yeah. Look, one way, that one tool. It's not it's not the exclusive tool of striking a balance. Is in fact to set up a, a calculation balance between the, the, the power being utilised and the potential offence involved. Now, the discussion paper talks about the different standards and thresholds. There, are, In some cases, there's uh, suggestions of linking it to offences that carry a three-year sentence, a five-year sentence or a seven-year sentence. You wouldn't exclusively apply it in that, in that circumstance for the reasons that Catherine spoke about, but there are some tools by which you can if not uh, precisely quantify the balance to be struck between the use of the power relative in a proportionate sense to the harm done, but sentencing 
uh, uh, length of sentence is, is one of the tools available to us, and it's something that we'd like some feedback on. There's, um, thank you. There's, there's quite a few questions that have a general theme of around protections and safeguards and um, preventing overreach. So I'll just take one as an illustrative example, but maybe the panel might want to extrapolate uh, in general about that topic. Um, so Wahid has asked, as some kinds of metadata become more useful, but also more privacy intrusive than previously anticipated, what are the panel's views on ensuring a new framework safeguards privacy on new and emerging types of communications and have appropriate thresholds for access? So, anyone like to jump in on that? Well, one comment, perhaps, uh, uh, Fergus, if I might, just to make at the start, I think part of this discussion needs to be a, a broader societal discussion about privacy. Uh, it, it's more than passing strange to me, and, and I understand why the point is raised, that we shed more of our own personal and sometimes quite intimate data in ways that we probably don't fully understand or appreciate. And, and uh, uh, the, the term surveillance capitalism has started to uh, gain traction. One of the points made by the proponents of the theory of surveillance capitalism, and this is surveillance by private companies. Uh, typically, I'm glad to say, Tom, not largely Microsoft, there are some of your some of your peers that are more typically uh, named in this respect. Uh, we have complex terms and conditions. You have uh, uh, mods that are, are built into software updates where you don't particularly fully understand uh, where the data is, is stored, scraped, utilised, consoled, etc. And so if we just take that general rubric, we could have a whole different seminar on surveillance capitalism. I think, I think the more immediate pressing problem for the citizenry is to actually understand what companies are doing with that personal and sometimes intimate data, uh, which is almost uh, to pick up the key idea in surveillance capitalism, turning your privacy, yourself, your preferences, your attitudes, uh, who you are into the commodity uh, that's been either sold uh, back to the prime company that's uh, that uh, within, with whom you've got a relationship or been unsold. So uh, everything that government will do will always be purposefully designed by the parliament to be much more restricted than that. We don't want that kind of, as citizens ourselves, I'm sure most of my colleagues who work in government don't want that sort of ubiquitous sense of being under the gaze of someone else uh, listening to you, looking at you, uh, understanding what you're doing. But that's in fact what's happening in our private lives through the emergence of surveillance capitalism. So I think there's a broader discussion. And then within, within that, as a subset of what governments can do, with all the checks and balances, the oversight, um, which is very properly put in place, I think we can have an informed discussion about uh, what, I, what I'm willing to accept in terms of government surveillance of me, which should be incidental. If, if your behaviours aren't of the categories that we've been talking about, you should be able to assume, unlike maybe some private companies, that you are not the subject of a gaze, of intrusion. And we'd very much like to land this legislation as a model exemplar back to uh, the private sector about how to engage in moderated self-restraining surveillance. People, at least in relation to government surveillance, should assume that if they're not in those networks that, that we've been talking about, they are in fact not the subject of surveillance. And that's very different, a very different direction from the way in which all of society is otherwise going. I just might add that uh, to Secretary Pizzullo's point, there is significant current oversight in the warrant process and with intelligence agencies particularly. We've obviously got IGES, we've got INSLAM, we've got a range of oversight um, capabilities there. Um, and to Secretary Pizzullo's point, there are no such, except with the exception of the EU, there are no such oversight provisions in, uh, in big tech, particularly some of the companies um, at all. And, um, and I think that is something for perhaps another ASPE or even join ASPE CRC panel around really what kind of a world we want to live in, that um, that the, the sense of privacy, uh, to pick up just on Secretary Pazulia's earlier point, the view is quite simple. If you are if you are beginning to embark upon serious criminal activities and in some cases are offences where even planning is an offence, 
then you lose the right to privacy. At, at, at least those who are guilty or are suspected of offences lose the right to privacy at that point. That's a very different matter to um, this sort of surveillance capitalism. But I think at, at, for another day, but I just wanted to support that point. Thank you. There's two quick observations on my end. One, this is a, a yet another reason why it's terrific to be doing the privacy consultation at the same time that we're doing this consultation so that we can have those discussions about the push and the pull of each of those. And then the second, really to amplify a point that Rachel made when she was putting on her, uh, her former Telstra hat, uh, your global harmonization is key, thinking about the international approach to this. How do we align or not align with the EU's general data protection regulation, which is the corner that really the flagship for most large multinational compliance efforts in the privacy space. Those are the types of issues that will come up in the privacy consultation and will be the subject of another wonderful ASPE event starring Fergus Hansen. Thanks, Del. <laughs> Catherine, are you back? Are we got you back? Uh, I hope, I, I hope yes. you have. Uh, thank you. Uh, some mysterious message came up on my screen from ASPE telling me I was permanently muted. So I, I don't know whether I should take that as a sign or not, but um, uh, uh, well, I was going to reference, uh, as Tom did, uh, that you know we are really grappling with some uh, significant uh, concepts and issues around personal privacy, uh, personal information, the the current review of the Privacy Act that Tom just uh, alluded to uh, is uh, an opportunity for us to to start to try to rethink. Um, uh, or, well, better understand uh, our sense of, of what we want to protect, how we want to protect it. I think the only point that I would add uh, to what Michael Zullo said is it, there, there is a recognition uh, that when it's a government agency uh, that's seeking to uh, uh, look at our information, surveil our information, uh, th there's no doubt that I think people think about that quite differently from what they think about uh, when they've, uh, they're using a device or providing information, whether it's for retail purposes or social communication uh, or, or other issues. And we, we, we need to recognise, um, I, think it's, I think it's a healthy thing that people uh, have that um, uh, level of uh, concern in terms of uh, the potential for government agencies to access information. Uh, and that's why uh, we need to work to ensure that the, the safeguards that we embed in this legislation and the ability to oversight uh, whatever actions are taken by uh, enforcement agencies uh, are absolutely sound and as strong as they can possibly be. So I think we do need to recognise, whilst there's a, I definitely agree, there's a broader conversation about what we understand privacy, what we're prepared to uh, either offer up or share in terms of our personal information uh, when it comes to government agencies uh, accessing that. We need to have the most um, uh, robust protections in place to, protect, to ensure appropriate use. Thank you very much. Um, well, we've come to the hour and um, I have still got questions streaming through. I have to thank everyone who has listened in today, the hundreds of people who have joined for their uh, wonderful questions and the wonderful volume of questions as well. Um, I also have to apologise that I've got through so few of them. Um, it shows, I think, the level of interest in this, um, this issue and the debate. Uh, and it's wonderful to see so many people engaged in it. Uh, very helpfully, we have a very long consultation process that will be ongoing for uh, through to 2023. So this is just the beginning and I'm sure uh, a very rich and lengthy opportunity to uh, provide your views to the government. Um, and I wanted to thank our panel uh, for making themselves available for the, the, the discussion and also uh, the questioning from uh, participants. It's been really wonderful to have such a distinguished uh, panel uh, willing to field so many questions on this topic. So thank you all very much for your time as well. Um, and good evening, everybody.